Are you as tired as I am of being asked, are you a pantser or a plotter? Why are there always only two options? And I'm not just saying this because I'm a non-binary writer who gets really fed up about little binaries when there are spectrums in everything. Well, I am neither a pantser nor a plotter. I am not an architect or a gardener, whatever term you like. I'm a gamer, and we're going to talk about what gaming is on this episode of my channel. I was in a project shadow because I'm so used to doing the podcast, and I'm going to leave that in because I think it's funny. Um, okay, so hi, my name's Charlie. I am a urban fantasy writer, a dark urban fantasy writer, and I write under the name of C.E. Dorset. If you want to find any of my work, you can find links to my Dragons of Night setting on my channel and down in the doobly-doo below. Okay, so I am a gamer, and I wish I could remember where I first came across this term for a writer, but I know it was on a post on a Pro Writing Aid's blog, and I read it, and it just hit me. Like, that's what I am. That's exactly what I am. That's what I do. And then when I went back to look for it, to link it here, I couldn't find it. So after I finish recording this, if I find it, I will definitely link it in the description below so I can give full credit to whoever full credit is owed to. But I love the term. I love the term. So what does it mean to be a gamer writer? So as a gamer writer, I approach my stories very differently. Just to go into my writing process just a wee little bit, very often my ideas start with an image. I don't have characters, I don't have a plot, I have an image that I just can't get out of my head. So I will zero draft in the form of a short story, something that will help me get it figured out and get through it just to see what's there. Very often in doing that, I will uncover the setting, I will uncover some characters, and I now have something to start working from. I try to limit that zero draft to about 4,800 words at most so that I don't get lost in the zero draft because developmental edits take forever and I don't like doing them. So I want to reduce as much of that as I can on the back end and get, get as much done ahead of time as I can. Having said that, outlining just destroys my creativity. It does. Once I have written out all of the events, I, I've written out all the events, and I'm no longer excited or interested in telling the story anymore. And it sucks, and it's terrible, and sometimes that's not been the case, but it takes writing from something that I really enjoy doing to just a job that I show up for. And I'm tired of that. <laughs> I'm honestly tired of that. So let's just get to the meat of it. What you've been waiting for. What is gaming? What does it mean to be a gamer writer? So I now have characters. I try to learn as much about them as I can before I get started. I like to do pictures so that I have a good idea of what they look like and often we'll have them up on a computer monitor next to me while I'm writing, especially early on, so that I'm looking at them and getting a feel of this is the person doing the, the actions. I want to get a sense of the world and understand what the world is and what it looks like. But I also want to know a couple plot points ahead. So I have, over the years, used the Save the Cat Beat Sheet and I'm really glad that other people have, you know, gotten into that, especially after the Save the Cat Writes a Novel comes came out, because they're really good, helpful plot points to see coming down the pike that you can then know where you're heading, where you're at in your story, and focus yourself so that you can get to where you want to be. I don't always know the end of the book when I get started, but I always know a bit ahead of where I am. And so my writing process hops back and forth between doing the actual writing, the drafting, and world building. So world building 
is a very important step. And I don't want you to freak out and I don't want you to run away because I know there are some people out there who do not like world building. To me, world building is any work you do on knowing, say, the layout of the building the story is take, takes place in, knowing who your characters are and who their family is, knowing more about the school they go to or the job that they have. All of that is world building. And every now and then in my writing, I come across things that I had not intended to be in the story. So I need to take a step back, flesh those out, and then go back. So why is this called being a gamer writer? Because it's basically writing a tabletop role-playing game for yourself. You see, I know the characters, I have some of the plot points, and I have a good idea of the setting. I then show up on the day, and when I do the drafting, I let it play out. I play the game to see what happens. Now, sometimes the characters make the decisions that I expect them to, sometimes they don't. And when they don't, I have to sit back and figure out what I'm going to do about that. I also, right beside my desk, keep my all holy ruby jar that on the inside has dice. These are often used to help me get through things. One, if a date comes up, I can pull out the appropriate number of dice and roll and date. Done. Dusted. Sometimes I don't know how I want an encounter to actually play out. So, I like the cipher system, which is very simple. You set a difficulty number for the task that you're doing. You roll your dice to see if you hit it. And huzzah, suddenly I have a determined result. I don't always do that. Not all of my story events are randomly dictated, but especially when I get stuck, it's a great way for me to just break through and keep going. It's been really helpful for me in keeping myself writing, keeping myself engaged, and keeping myself on track lately. And it's one of the reasons I've gotten over 3,800 words, I keep saying 100, 38,000 words written this month already since the first. That's a lot, especially for me. I don't usually write that fast. Now, granted, there were two 10K Sundays mixed in there, and I got words, pretty good words on both of them. Got 10, actually hit 10K on the last one. I don't know if I'm going to do any more 10K Sundays if they do them, because oh, they hit hard, but I, I'm very excited. But also... I'm allowing myself to just play in the world and have fun with it. As, as my husband has learned, this book is my new favorite TV show. I, I'm sitting down and I'm playing with the characters and I'm watching it happen and unfold in front of me in virtual real time. And that's so helpful in keeping me engaged. And I feel that if you as a writer are engaged then your readers are going to be engaged as well. And I've learned that over the years. The stories that I was just absolutely absorbed in writing and that I just couldn't get out of my head, those are the ones that I have always gotten the most feedback from readers on. Positive and negative, because, you know, haters going to hate. But they're the ones that I've gotten the most feedback on over the years. The ones where I knew what was going to happen and just showed up and I typed the words and I made sure they were pretty words. People were okay with them, people didn't hate them, but they weren't the most popular thing. Just saying. So, that's my experience. Yours may vary. I'm just getting tired of this whole idea of there is only two ways that you can write a book, because... Everything is on a spectrum, y'all, and some people are going to be on more of one side than on the other. But I really want to invite you to play the game with me, because the game is fun. And I'm going to do something that I've never really tried to do before. I'm going to show you a little bit of how I set up the game board in Scrivener to make this happen. And I'm really nervous because I've never tried to do this kind of video before, so let's see if this works out. That you can see on the screen, I have set up two 
episode. See, when I started working on this project, I was originally intending it to be a podcast novel. Still haven't decided whether or not I'm going to go with that or not, but I'm continuing with the convention for now because it's been really, really helpful. So you can see I've set up a 30-minute Save the Cat and a 45-minute Save the Cat, depending on how long I wanted each individual episode to be. And you can see the beat sheets listed down the side here. Now, each one of those is a scene in Scrivener. Each one of those scenes is there with its own assigned word count. I sat down with a spreadsheet and created each one of these scenes to cover each one of these beats and tell me how many words are supposed to be in each. They're also color-coded to say which part of the story that they're in and all that because I'm that kind of a writer. I like to over-embellish my work. So as I'm writing, as you can see here, I have my opening image, theme stated, catalyst. Each one of these has its own word count down here at the bottom, telling me how long that scene should be. These are the rules of the game. Now, sometimes my scenes are longer, sometimes they're shorter, and sometimes they may be completely changed when I go into editing. But this has been extremely helpful for me because I can stay on track. So if I move up here, you can see one of the actual chapters that I've currently worked on and that I'm wor currently working on. So you can see that these are two 30 minute chapters, each one. As you can see, I change the icon as I get the chapter finish, I get that scene finished so that I know exactly where I am at a glance really easily as I'm going through. And I always know where to pick up in doing this. So some of these, and I will click in because, you know, if you see just a little bit, um, that's okay for the story. You can see here's my opening image for this particular chapter, which happens a little bit later in the book. It was supposed to be around 48 words. I wrote 50 words and knew it was time to move on to the theme. This is keeping me moving. It's helping me to keep playing the game. Now, some of you will want more rules than this. Some of you will want less. But no matter what you want, no matter what helps you, figuring out that plan really will keep you consistent and keep you moving towards your goals of getting your story done. This is how I'm currently playing the game, and it's really helping me out a lot. So hopefully it will work for you. Now I have my Scrivener document set up, and that's been a huge help in getting through all this. Now, one other, well, two other things that have helped a lot in the way that I play the game, two of my other rules that I find vitally important. One I learned from David Gerald in his wonderful book, um, Worlds of Wonder. He says in that book to keep your scenes, and he suggests your chapters, under 800 words. That way you never bog down, it keeps you from doing crazy long info dumps, and it keeps the story moving. Over the last several years, I have desperately tried to do that. Some of my scenes are longer, some of my scenes are shorter, but I, I try to keep it around 800 words to keep the story going, especially in my first or zero draft. I really try to keep the word count down. You can always add more, but I really hate taking words away, so I try to keep that down. The second thing, and if you all want me to, let me know down in the comments, I'll do a whole video on this, but I started about two years ago writing using a um, Kisho Ten Ketsu model of writing, which is a much more Japanese style of telling a story, and it's a nested doll. So each part of your story should have four elements, ki, sho, ten, and ketsu. Now what does that mean? In ki, introduction. You should introduce the characters, introduce the setting, introduce the problem, introduce the world. Sho is your development. You take whatever you've set up at the beginning and you develop it. Go into it further, more information, build it out, let more people in on what's going on in the world, really fleshing it out. Then 10. 
Part three, the twist. Now, the twist is so vitally important to this style of storytelling. You should have a twist on the macro level of your story. So on the big level, your story should have these four parts. But each scene in each chapter should also have these. So as you saw with my layout there, anytime I'm heading up to the break into three, uh, that's it. I need to figure out what the twist is and make sure the twist happens there so that I can go into the following sec section, the ketsu, the, ke the, which is the, uh, the harmony, the harmonizing of it, the bringing it all back together. So now that you've had your twist, now that your twist has happened, you have to find a way to make the, it harmonize, make it make sense with what happened before so that it's not just, oh, that came out of nowhere and now we're going that way now. You should be doing this on the scene level. You should be doing this preferably on the page level if you're writing like that. But since everybody's going to be reading these on their Kindles or on the paperback, it's hard to do that on a page. But if you're doing comics, every page should have Ki Sho Ten Ketsu on the page. Every one. If you've ever read manga and really gotten into it, that's one of the reasons why, because every page needs to have these four elements. It needs to have its introduction, development, twist, and then some kind of, not necessarily resolution, but something that brings it back into context with everything that came before so the twist doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. Every page, every scene, every chapter, and the entire story, and if, like me, you're working on a series, the entire series needs to have those four elements as well. And that really helps keep you on your toes, because if you're writing a scene and you know that this is your break in to, to or this is your fun and games, you know that that scene that you're writing needs to have its introduction, its development, a twist, and some kind of harmonization that brings it all back into context. Now, the twist, this doesn't have to be some like, M. Night Shyamalama Lama Lama or Alfred Hitchcock level twist. The twist just needs to be something that the audience thought was going on suddenly changes. Something happens that breaks the way that you're looking at the world. So a really good, very clear example that I think a lot of you have probably seen in Miyazaki's movie, um, in the Studio Ghibli film, spirited away when they first arrive at the abandoned amusement park everything seems normal everything seems fine and we see this setup we see the development as they're going walking around and looking at everything and then her parents start turning into pigs twist this twist happens suddenly out of nowhere and you're like oh my goodness so that's what's happening here but then that's quickly followed up by normalizing it because they accidentally crossed the river, they crossed into the spirit world, and they're in a place now where the spirits are active. So we're brought back into harmony, and we continue to follow our character as we go through yet another introduction, development, and then eventually twist and bringing it all back into harmony. Over and over again, we follow this each time. When no face is introduced into this into the story, we see they're introduced, we see that development happen, we then see this twist as to who they really are, and that's followed by some kind of harmonization that brings the character back into the world, and we go, oh, okay, that's how that works. This kind of writing has completely changed my my life, because most Western writing is all about conflict. It's conflict, cl conflict, conflict, and if you're that kind of a writer, more power to you. But I get really frustrated when I'm watching a TV show or I'm reading a book and all the characters do is bicker and argue because there has to be tension and there has to be some kind of conflict constantly. Yes, there needs to be tension, there needs to be something in there, a push and pull, but if what you're moving towards is more this idea of 
things are going to be changing and characters are going to be acting and reacting to what's going on, you don't have to worry quite as much about keeping that dramatic tension up to keep you through the story. At least that's what I found. So this is how I have been playing the game lately, and I hope it really, really helps because I have gotten so much writing done since I adopted this method, and it has helped me out a lot. So maybe next time when somebody asks you what kind of a writer you are, instead of saying that you're a pantser or a plotter or a planter or an architect or a gardener, maybe you'll join me and say, I'm a gamer. I play the game. And remember, the game can have your rules, not my rules. You don't have to follow my rules. These are just how I play the game. How do you play the game? Let me know down in the comments if this has helped you. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to do them. And like I said, if you want me to do a bigger video about the Kishoten Ketsu, I will definitely do that. There are some English language videos on YouTube about this, but many of the ones that I learned it from have been taken down. And a lot of what I've read has been translated from Japanese. So I, I, if I know of any resources, I'll try to put them in the show, in the show notes. If not, if you know some, Put, the, put them in the comments. That would be awesome. Alrighty. I hope this video has been helpful for you. I'm really trying to be of use to, to, to help share some of my knowledge and experience with you all. Thank you again so much for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell if that would be something that you would like to do to know when I'm doing stuff. I am going to be starting to do live streams with Grayson Wild, so definitely be looking at that. We're setting up our schedule now, and I will be announcing those on my Instagram and on my Twitter, probably. Um, so Instagram, definitely the best place to follow me if you want to keep up with everything that I'm doing. Also, I am going to be streaming with Abigail Ford doing some live streams with her on Thursday, next Thursday, and the Thursday after that, I believe at noon. But again, fo follow everything. I'm terrible. I will try to put times and stuff in the description. A lot's going on. A lot's going on. I'm also filming a bunch of interviews with writers. If you are a writer that would like to be interviewed for this channel and my podcast, get in touch with me. I would love to talk to you. And I think that's it. Oh, and you can support me on Patreon, Coffee, all that's down in the thingy below. Thank you for everybody who does that. Normally, this is the part of the episode where people do their whole, you know, thank you to my patrons. If you do become a patron, I will say your name here. But uh, because of everything going right on right now, I feel like I need to dedicate this portion of the video to saying Black Lives Matter, Trans Black Lives Matter, and I am going to instead read more names of African American women who have died at the hands of police officers as a part of the Say Her Name movement. <sighs> this is hard, and thank you for everybody who watches to the end, because we need to be telling their stories. So, Shelley Frey, Margaret Laverne Mitchell, Eleanor Bumpers, Katherine Johnson, Danette Daniels, Frankie Ann Perkins, Alberta Spurrell, Tanisha Anderson, Michelle Cousseau, Pearly Golden, Sharice Francis, Kayla Moore, and Taisha Miller. This needs to end. We need to constantly be out there doing everything that we can to end systemic racism and to bring justice into our country and into our world. So, if you don't know their stories, I and you have the fortitude to learn them, they are tragic and just horrific. But we we have to change everything on that note until next time i hope you get all the words and don't forget to have the fun because even protesting and speaking out is fun